Hello class. Today I'd like to welcome you to Undergraduate Survey of the Civil War. Uh, we'll be looking at a controversial topic today, one that's still a little bit debated by historians. Um, we'll be discussing the role of Ulysses S. Grant in slavery. Um, we'll look at his personal views as documented in his personal memoirs as well as that of his wife, um, Julia Grant. Um, for many, when you hear the name Ulysses S. Grant, um, a lot of people think of the Union, you may think of the Civil War or the Presidency. Um, you may even think of freedom for enslaved individuals, but a lot of people don't think of um, him or his wife as slave owners. Um, to answer this question though, we're gonna go back and we're gonna start at the beginning. Um, Grant grew up in Ohio on a farm in which um, his family did not own slaves. Um, he describes his father and mother as kind and Christian. Um, he recollects that he never even remembers being punished or scolded as a child. Um, he, he recollects his family very kindly and um, very sweetly. He says that um, the only time he remembers being um, pretty much scolded was when he was at school, um, at the schoolhouse. And um, at the age of 17, he left for West Point to begin his military training. He really never had hopes of being a general or climbing the military ladder. He actually wanted to be um, a professor. Um, but at West Point, he made really good friends with a young man named Frederick Dent, um, who would become his roommate in his final year of training. Um, the Dent family lived just five miles of the barracks that he was um, living in called Jefferson Barracks. And as he had taken his horse from Ohio um, up to West Point with him, he would often visit the Dent family with um, his good friend, Frederick. He became close to all of the Dents. And that summer, um, Julia came home from boarding school. It wasn't uncommon for young ladies to go to boarding school or finishing school. And um, she came home and she was 17 years old. And um, their relationship slowly blossomed into more and uh, they had a one-year courtship, and they admitted that they didn't even realize that it was turning into more um, until he was ordered away from Jefferson Barracks, and he came over um, to where she lived to tell her that he had been ordered away, and um, they both said they felt a depression of spirit um, when he said that he had to leave, and um, they ended up becoming engaged in that year when they realized that they felt more um, they were engaged to be married in May of 1844. However, Grant, because he was going into the military, um, he ended up being called away to the Mexican-American War. He was gone for four years. And um, so they had just got engaged and he ended up having to leave for four years time. Um, during this four year time span, he did extremely well for himself um, as far as rank. Um, he ended up being promoted to the rank of first lieutenant. Um, once the Treaty of Peace was ratified and the war ended, the Mexican-American War ended, Grant obtained a four-month leave, um, during which time he visited his, visited his family in Ohio and Julie, uh, Julia in Missouri. They were married on August 22nd, 1848 at Whitehaven Plantation. And this is really where the story of um, slavery and slave ownership um, really begins. Um, you see, Julia's family owned the plantation Whitehaven, and this is where the couple fell in love. Unlike her husband, Julia grew up around enslaved people her entire life. Um, Whitehaven was a very large plantation made up of, of basically two different properties. Um, it was a 750 acre plantation that she called her childhood home. Um, she recollects that her father was a, a businessman who was very wise in business, um, but the, she calls her mother delicate. Um, she calls her a delicate woman who trusted her servants. This is really just a nice way to say um, that she basically let the servants do all the housework. She says that um, her, her mom managed the house and managed the kitchen. Um, basically, the servants did everything. And her mom really didn't do a lot. Um, she has stories of basically, like if one of the kids got hurt, the servants took care of them. If she wanted something cooked, her mom basically said, this is what I want made. The servants did it. So her mom was very delicate. Her mom didn't um, 
didn't do much around the plantation. Um, everyone else did. Um, but she recalls her childhood as being happy days and she recalled everyone around her as being happy. It's interesting um, because she wrote this as an adult, but she it's her recollections of looking back on her childhood. This is what she says. She says, um, I think of our people um, as being very happy. At least they were in mama's time, though the young ones became somewhat demoralized about the beginning of the rebellion, talking about the Civil War, when all the comforts of slavery passed away forever. My father was the most kind and indulgent to his people, too much so perhaps, as later in life, as the old Kentucky song says, by and by hard times come a knocking at the door. Um, she calls herself her dad's pet. Um, she was the fifth child. There were four boys born and then finally they had a girl. Um, so her dad doted on her and, um, you know, pretty much gave her what she wanted. So she says, I remember doing many little kindnesses for the men servants, meaning the, the male slaves. Um, Uncle Charles, Bob, Willis, William, and Jim, who invariably came to me when they wanted a little tobacco, whiskey, or money. Any of these men would say, won't little mistress tell master I would like to go home tonight, or our tobacco's getting mighty low, or won't little mistress tell master the cold's getting mighty penetrating this morning, or little mistress, won't you tell master I was going to see my old wife this evening, and would like to take her some sugar for her coffee. And I would go and thrust my hand into Papa's pocket up to my elbow until my hand caught a half dollar or a quarter. My dear Papa would say, what are you doing, you little rascal? I will draw up my hand and try up and show a coin or two and say, Uncle Willis or Uncle Charles is going home tonight and wants to buy something for his wife. And these dear old black uncles always brought to me uh, pet rabbits, squirrels, and all the prettiest birds and eggs they found. The first ripe strawberries, the reddest apples, and the first melons were brought to Miss Julia. She, th she sees this as a happy time and everybody around her was happy and did things for her. Um, she really doesn't see um, any harm in these times. Um, to Julia, this, this was just normal life. Um, as she ages, she continues to recall times around enslave, enslaved individuals in her memoirs. Um, Grant is very silent in his memoirs about these things. Um, however, there is a manumission letter that exists. Um, manumission is when you would set an enslaved individual free. There is a manumission letter that exists um, showing that he was the last president to own an, an enslaved individual. Um, this manu manumission letter actually says, um, know all persons by these present that I, Ulysses S. Grant of the city and county of St. Louis in the state of Missouri, uh, for diverse good and valuables consideration for considerations, me hereunto moving do hereby emancipate and set free from slavery. My Negro man, William, sometimes called William Jones of mulatto complexion, aged 35 years and about five five feet, seven inches in height, and being the same slave purchased by me of Frederick Dent, that probably was her father, um, her, his wife, Julia's father. She had a brother by the same name, but her, his father, her father was the same name. Um, and I do hereby manument, emancipate, and set free said William from slavery forever in testimony whereof I hereto set my hand and seal at St. Louis this 29th day of March, A.D. 1859, Ulysses S. Grant. So at some point, he purchased this man, either from her brother or her father, most likely her father, um, and, and set him free, March 29th, 1859. Um, so there is record of um, Julia owning um, slaves because they were given to her by her dad. Um, and though we know that she... Um, she was gifted people, at least four people by her father, um, and he benefited from this. Um, Grant benefited from the ownership of, of Julia's slaves. We know that he obviously owned slaves as well, at least one, because he set at least one free. Um, so it's interesting. A lot of historians, this is where the debate comes in, because some historians say, did he own more than this? Um, some historians say, well, well, we know for a fact he owned at least one because he, there's a manumission letter for at least one that we found. So the, there's a, there's a debate that exists, um, for how many for sure did, um, did he own? Because we know 
that he owned for sure at least one. And it, he wasn't an ignorant man. Um, he knew that there was profitability in slavery. In his memoirs, he says this. He says, there were two political parties, it is true, in all the states, both strong in number and respectability, but both equally loyal to the institution which stood paramount in Southern eyes to all other institutions in state or nation. The slave owners were the minority, but governed both parties. Had politics ever divided the slaveholders and the non-slaveholders, the majority would have been obliged to yield or war would have been the consequence. I do not know that Southern people were to blame for this condition of affairs. There was a time when slavery was, slavery was not profitable and the discussion of the merits of the institution was confined almost exclusively to the territory where it existed. The state of Virginia and Kentucky came near abolishing slavery by their own acts, one state defeating the measure by a tie vote and the other only lacking one. But when the institution became profitable, all talk of its abolition ceased where it existed and naturally as human nature is constituted arguments were adduced in its support the cotton gin probably had much to do with it, with the justification of slavery he obviously knew um that owning slaves was a profitable event there is even a letter that exists where he talks about um renting out julia's four slaves that she inherited from her father um and they in her memoir she talks about their ages being from age 12 to 18 and he talks about renting out a young boy we don't know if it was the youngest or not but being able to rent out a young boy for the cost of at least three dollars per day and more as he aged so he knew the profitability of slavery um and benefited from it whether he owned them or julia owned them so in the beginning um i asked you the question um when you hear the name ulysses s grant and his wife do you think of them as slave owners the truth is they were. Thank you.